Good morning, Connections. It is Sunday, November 27th, 22. I'm glad you're here. I know that you would rather be with us in service today. And I know obstacles get in the way. A reminder, we are attempting to get our streaming up and running, and we are working towards that. But in the interim, this is the bridge between Friday and Monday. And simply to, to help transition so you know what we were talking about on Sunday, so as we begin our conversations on Monday, you won't feel lost. So, once again, thank you for being here. Let's get started. We're finishing out our question, why did Jesus have to die? By looking at blood. Now, we first get a a glimpse of the importance of blood here in Leviticus 17 when we're talking about the sacrificial system that God places as part of the law. For the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. This would occur on the Day of Atonement and was the placeholder, if you will, of what Jesus would accomplish on the cross. So we're going to return here to Leviticus as we study Hebrews this week, but I first want to start with perhaps a different understanding of blood. For since we didn't live in, in the Old Testament times, in the, the times of, of blood sacrifice, perhaps we've lost a bit of a meaning. But when you and I talk about blood, we are often talking about relationship, blood relationship. We often say things like, blood is thicker than water, expressing the bond that we have with one another. And as we open up Hebrews, which talks an awful lot and looks back to the sacrifice that were made as part of the atonement process, interestingly enough, the first stop in Hebrews is talking about the blood that you and I perhaps have better understanding of. Relationship, kinship, bonds in, between family. Hebrews 2, 11. Now, Hebrews 1, which we aren't examining, and I, again, Hebrews is a rich uh, book found in the New Testament that I'm not going to be able to do justice to. So I encourage you to start at the beginning of Hebrews and read all the way through this week, and you'll understand and have a greater depth than what I can offer today. But Hebrews 1 is about establishing Jesus' authority, just as we witnessed that being established by John the Baptist last week. In Hebrews 2, it's referencing the bond of blood. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Who is the author referencing? You and me. We have a greater bond with Jesus than perhaps we know how to express. And that comes through our relationship, our blood. In 14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying. Now that's a great big brother. We understand that bond. We are willing to, to, to fight for those who we feel closest to, our brothers, our sisters, 
are cousins. Jesus has that same bond. He's not ashamed of us. He's willing to do whatever it takes. And that certainly leads us to a better understanding of why he chose to sacrifice himself for us. We can say it that God so loved the world that he gave his son, but why did his son give his life? Because he wasn't giving his life to a group of strangers. He was giving his life for his brothers and sisters. That bond of blood. So, if we look back at the the creation of the law, God builds into it this sacrificial system, this day of atonement, conducted by the high priest in order to, to cleanse the sin of the Jews. Now, the power in that was because it was created by God. But it was simply a placeholder for Jesus' blood. So as we dig deeper into Hebrews, here in Hebrews 9, 12, we start understanding the power of Jesus' blood to satisfy the law. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, like designated in the Old Testament, with his own blood he entered the most high place once and for all and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Again, that's that kind of nod to the placeholder, that there was a sacrifice that was going to be required for their redemption, just like the sacrifice that was required for our redemption. Same one. But because the Messiah, because Jesus had not been revealed, this was the system in place prior. The power comes through Jesus' blood to satisfy. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. We have to consider what the cost of our sins, as we have in previous weeks, and now recognize that that is satisfied. The contract fulfilled by Jesus' blood. So we have the Old Testament model and then it coming to the fore in perfection through Jesus. And that's where we move into a slightly different direction and one that we'll emphasize not only today but also throughout the week, which is and just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes to judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all times as sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Jesus' sacrifice, the Day of Atonement came each year with new sacrifices required to cover for the next year. That placeholder was, was established throughout the Old Testament. Now, it was all meant for paying attention and looking towards God 
remaining focused in our relationship, making focus the the requirements to cleanse us of sin. Now, we know that in looking at the Old Testament, because it was such routine and because it became ceremonial and just a religious practice, oftentimes it lost its meaning. And God corrects several times saying, the actual sacrifice doesn't mean anything to me. The recognition that you have sins that need atoning for and it costs the blood. And then we look forward to Jesus. Now, where this passage is leading is this isn't just another atoning sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that all of those sacrifices that came before were pointing to. And unlike the old system, this is a once and forever sacrifice. We've referenced it in the past that too often we treat Jesus' death, we treat the you know, coming into Easter as, as recognizing that we need atonement. And then we get past that and we go back into our sin. And we're in the same pattern that perhaps the Jews were in. Of, well, it's okay. I can sin. There'll be a day of atonement. Cleanse me, and then I can get myself all messed up again. That's not the case. When we have that mindset, we are crucifying Jesus over and over we fail to recognize his importance. We have failed to recognize that it is by his blood that all of the sins, whether they're Old Testament, New Testament, current or future, are covered by his blood. He will come again, but not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly are eagerly waiting for him. Honor God, honor the sacrifice that Jesus made by not seeing this as a license to sin, but recognizing that Jesus died once and for all so that we would no longer sin and live righteously before all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you, Lord, for laying down your life so that we might live. We recognize today, Lord, that your blood is the atoning sacrifice required to satisfy the law. We recognize today that you gave your life because of the bond that you share with us. You see us as your brothers and sisters. You died for the blood. Help us to honor you with ours. We present ourselves today as a living sacrifice to you. The rest of our days, may they be used to bring other brothers and sisters into right relation. For your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll see you back here tomorrow. Got something a little bit different planned. Be shorter, perhaps. It's going to be clunkier, absolutely. But I pray that it'll come off with an encouraging word 
a little bit something different. Till then, know that I love you and I miss you. Please be good.